I think there are so many ways that we can take a sane approach, a balanced approach. Uh, we can say, because we don't know all of the detail of how the future will unfold, it behoves us for generations to come, even those living now, to tread carefully. And tread careful, treading carefully does mean making alterations. But should we go overboard on one particular brand A or brand B or one particular option? And that seems to me to be not a smart way to go. Because what we know is that if there's a broad will to make change, and we see that in Australia, we've signed on for zero by 2050, uh, both sides and all states, uh, et cetera, have done that. If we see that there's a broad will, it's pretty hard to say that any one particular path is going to get us there faster with less negative impacts as well as positive uh, impacts as others. So you actually do need a range of activities going on that will then deliver you to the path. And if you find that uh, the things that you choose to be your preferred paths are having no impact, uh, heaven forbid, but if that's what you find, well then of course you change the paths that you're on. But all I would remind, uh, not that you need reminding of it, John, um, innovation is path dependent. The more you get into something, the more you learn, the more opportunities open up and away you go. It's very, very hard to say, pick this path because I know 999 out of 1,000 also think they know. I take the point. And in terms of being active on a multiplicity of fronts, one of the things that I think we need to really try and get people to understand is that we'll make the task a lot easier if you can pull some of the, some of the uh, emissions that are out there back out of the system and put them away again. Uh, and so the term is net zero. And a lot of people think that this is all about generating electricity with no emissions and moving to transport systems with no emissions and what have you. The first problem, of course, is that feeding people will always involve carbon emissions, always. Uh, roughly at the moment, uh, I think agriculture is worryingly dependent on fossil fuel myself. I have for many, many years, worryingly. We're feeding vast numbers of people, doing it very well. The world's farmers are really doing an incredible job. But the amount of fossil fuel used is enormous. You're not going to be able to reduce that carbon to zero. You can't do it, those emissions, and still feed people. So we've got to find ways to offset. And part of that um, is, we think, uh, you and I have talked about it a lot, and that's why I'm so keen to hear your views put before as many people as possible, that there are real opportunities uh, to um, respond in part, in large part, a significant part potentially, uh, by absorbing and sequestering carbon. This is an interesting uh, topic. Um, there are a few points there, um, one of which is at the end of the day, it's about net zero. Uh, you can have a plus here as long as you've got a minus there and the two uh, cancel out. But where net zero and offsets and sequestering, I think, got off to a bad start uh, was uh, some perhaps poor use of language or not fully appreciating that some people would see the notion of negative emissions and sequestering as just an excuse for not doing anything and letting the emitters keeping on as they are. So all of the debate, for example, around carbon capture and storage in geological formations, um, disused oil wells or uh, oil and gas uh, reservoirs and so forth, um, was just seen as a debate for allowing people to keep on burning uh, fossil uh, fuels. Right. And uh, we'll, uh, perhaps I'll come to the uh, soil uh, one in just a moment, but just to concentrate on this net and 
positive and negative um, uh, emissions. And um, it's a pity with uh, geological sequestration that the debate got very polarised into, well, look, uh, nobody's doing it much. Well, you know, there are 40 million plus tonne a year in the US being uh, sequestered of carbon uh, into the ground. And it's going into oil and gas fields. Uh, they're not really using saline aquifers yet. Um, because there's plenty of uh, capacity there to do it. So it's hardly an unproven uh, uh, technology. But you would need um, uh, not those sort of numbers, but 10 and 100 times those numbers to offset just continuing to burn fossil fuels. So that's not the answer. But there are some areas that we really can't see getting down to net zero. Um, the it's not up that I'm trying to avoid the agricultural one, John, I will get to it. Um, such as making cement. Uh, you know, when you burn limestone, calcium carbonate to get through to calcium oxide to go into the clinker, boom, where does the CO2 go? And nobody's figured out a way to really do that other than capturing it and putting it away geologically or reacting it with rock and building mountains of uh, waste rock uh, or whatever. Uh, similarly with aviation, while people are talking about electric and hydrogen powered aircraft, etc., I don't think we're going to see the world's aviation doing that by 2050. I think it's more likely that some areas and some long distance transport, you know, we're still going to need liquid fuels, thank you very much, and they will give CO2. So for all of those, we've got to have negatives somewhere to offset the positives that we can't bring down to zero. So turning to agriculture, um, the Green Revolution doesn't get talked much about these days, but the notion of uh, readily available fertilizer, um, um, proper uh, tri and intensive, more and more intensive uh, farming, uh, and very selective uh, species. I mean, who grows long stalk wheat these days, uh, for example, because why do you want to put energy into uh, stalks when you can be putting it into grain and, and so on? By the way, the answer is if you live in a thatched cottage, as I did for a few years, you actually do need long grained uh, wheat to rethatch the roof every now and then. But that's just an aside. Coming back to the point, the agriculture that's come from the green revolutions in every country, uh, including developing uh, countries uh, are picking this up, as such that we can sustain a population, I think that's well above what you could do with less intense agriculture. Now, this is a bit of an alarm bell because the arable land or the land that's available to us, as we all know, particularly in a rather dry and can be dusty country uh, like Australia is actually limited. We're sort of using all of it uh, now. So can we get the emissions that are associated with transport of fuels to the farm, with uh, making the chemicals that are used uh, as pesticides, weedicides, etc., cetera, um, and um, uh, the diesel um, uh, for machinery on the farm, uh, etc. Uh, let alone the fertilizers themselves, can we get the emissions associated with that way, way down? And I think the answer is yes, we can. Um, the last thing that we want to do, uh, it just seems silly to me, is to turn around and say, well, buy up uh, farmland, plant it out with trees, sell the offsets, and everyone is uh, better off. The farmers can retire with a marvelous um, pile of money. Um, the offsets can get sold on the international uh, market. And that, that's a pretty good way of uh, getting out down to net zero. But excuse me, what happens to the farm products, be they food, be they animal, uh, or be they um, a timber or what have you, um, that were going to be produced on that land? You've taken it out of action. We can't support the world's population by wholesale reforestation. There isn't the land to do it. We can change our farming practices so that we need part of which is about tree planting and riparian uh, uh, techniques, um, deeper rooted perennials, uh, a whole host of things which allow us actually to get away with less emissions. Why? Because we need less fertilizer, for example. 
and less chemicals. Uh, and why? Because we're into no-till, so we're not using so much diesel um, uh, on the farm in any case. Um, our productivity, it's envisaged, can even go up rather than down. And the soil carbon, the carbon that we sequester in the soil, is a net negative. It's a, if you like, it's a positive offset. It counts against the overall emissions.